Nermain's book is called The Present as History, Critical Perspectives on Global Power. And then in this, she interviews 13 different people that uh, I suspect many of you may not know by name, but you cannot read a dozen pages here without having to think about it for half an hour, 45 minutes, just to let it percolate in your head. Uh, the book itself talks about a lot of big issues, imperialism and global economics, the uh, legacy of colonialism, neocolonialism, economic inequality, global and institutional frameworks, political uh, Islam, secularism, feminism, and human rights. A big target there, you know, how, how do you miss? But it, 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 it's a wonderful book, it, it truly is. Uh, Nermain has uh, a degree from Cambridge University in philosophy, and she's also studied at Queen's University in Canada. I think uh, all of us know that uh, she's on democracy now. Uh, not every day, but uh, often, frequently enough that we recognize that, and that's a big part of uh, five hours of my life every week uh, to, to listen to that show, and I think a lot of you probably fall in that category. Uh, she's worked for the uh, Sustainable Development uh, for Policy in Islamabad. Uh, she worked in London at the in, uh, International Institute for the Environment and Development. And she also works at the Asia Society still in New York, correct? No? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, you need to cross that off. But a very busy person, very talented. And... Uh, she has uh, two YouTube things that I, that I think are just outstanding. One is a TEDx talk that was recorded in uh, Danubia, Hungary, back in 2013. Uh, translating words, it's called. And uh, talking about the promise of democracy with that. And three years ago, uh, three years and a month, just about, she was here at the Space Gallery in Portland and did a talk on violence as salvation. And one of the points that you had to take away from that is she talked about how people are always uh, blaming the other guy for having an evil intent, bad purposes, but so frequently our use of power and violence as part of that power is touted for its benevolence, the noble purposes, and uh, that just does, isn't true. And uh, Nermain at that time uh, suggested that we look at effects and not intentions, which I think is a great thing to keep in the back of your head as you listen to people talk uh, about campaigns and, and such. Uh, not intentions, but the effects. And so, without anything further, I'll bring you to our distinguished guest this evening, Nermain Sheikh. Please give her a big hand. Thank you all so much um, for coming here and to Peace Action Maine for so graciously inviting me. So as you probably know, or perhaps you don't, the topic, um, I'll be speaking on progress, uh, the idea of progress, uh, and specifically, what is the measure of progress? So I'll speak for about 20 minutes, and then it would be wonderful if we could have uh, a proper discussion, which I think will probably be the most interesting part of the evening, uh, as far as my own conversation talk goes. So what is the measure of progress? In everyday language and understanding, progress is taken to be a self-evident good, desirable by all humanity. The very idea of progress, its practice, its implementation, its power, has been justified, indeed made a necessity, by the conviction that its spread will herald a new era of peace and prosperity in the world. Despite the reservations that have been articulated more recently, and for all its imperfections and failures, its full realization is the goal to which we ought to aspire. If one is to assume then, indeed self-evidently, that this is true, what is it that progress has brought in its wake that is indeed self-evidently good? 
As many point out, of course correctly, humankind is today at the historical peak of its possibilities in the sense both of shaping the world and directing its trajectory. Economic resources are greater than ever before. Material extreme poverty has been substantially reduced in much of the world. There have been massive advances in scientific technical knowledge, most notably in medicine and its curative possibilities and effects. Human rights law universally applicable has for decades granted formal equality between and among individuals of all races, genders, and among those with other differentiating ascriptive characteristics. And finally, though of course not exhaustively, relatively seamless communication and engagement with peoples all over the world has now been made possible on a scale previously unimaginable. So yes, progress has been all that, of course, yet it has been much else and has brought about much else. This lecture will address that remainder, the much else which remains largely unspoken. The world, and most recently and in the present moment, what is referred to as the third world or the global south, which exists, of course, also here in the North, has been subject to this imperative, the imperative to progress, the necessity of progress as a means to emancipation, if not liberation. The term developing countries is in fact an indication of precisely that. These countries are developing along a continuum whose ultimate objective is to become developed. So what has this involved? What have been its harms hidden and revealed? What has progress brought about for millions, even billions of people across our shared earthly terrain? As many will recognize in much of the world, the march of progress has also entailed an extraordinary violence across several registers, cultural, temporal, psychic, and material. This propulsion forward, or is it backward, has in the most generous interpretation, unintentionally, led to the eradication of hundreds of languages, societies, ways of life, cultural practices. Simultaneously, or indeed as a consequence, the peoples of the world now inhabit life forms more uniform, almost indistinguishable on a scale unprecedented in its global reach. Though here one hesitates to use the word unprecedented, so banal has it become in its sheer repetition. We would do well to recall that progress and its gift modernity has swept everyone in its wake and the ravages of modernity precisely in its completeness is made the most apparent in the places of the world where we perceive mostly its absence. One thinks for instance of the assumption that parts of the third world remain pre-modern or primitive it is here, after all, that the majority of the excluded billions live, as though somehow they have not caught up with the time in which they find themselves, as though, in fact, it is possible to live in this time and simultaneously outside it, in a parallel or perhaps even backward temporal universe, an assumption that fails entirely to consider that not a place on Earth has been left untouched by contemporary systemic forms of power and coercion, intervention and subordination, violence and exclusion. To take only the most obvious example, no people have been spared the experience or minimally the effects of colonialism or that most modern of forces, capitalism. 
So whatever failures or insufficiencies, indeed perversions of modernity we witness, have perhaps to do with the place to which such areas have been relegated in the contemporary hierarchy of power, not in fact their position outside of it. And yet the triumph of progress, its conquests and successes are what we are told, what is insisted upon. Its damages are less evident, its casualties even less so. Among the least violent instances, one thinks of the linguistic hierarchies produced in much of the formerly colonized world, which have resulted in nothing less than class apartheid. From Algeria to Pakistan, fluency in the colonial language, French and English respectively, is a mark of distinction, enabling membership in the elite classes, comprising of course only a tiny minority, far above the millions or even billions who speak the native language, or even worse, the languages referred to with only barely veiled condescension as a dialect or vernacular, no longer even dignified with the appellation language, or in another instance, the designation as native or traditional, the garments worn in these societies for centuries as though to have progressed sufficiently to have become fully modern, people must adopt and routinely wear so-called Western attire, only resorting to traditional wear on special occasions, the occasions themselves often the sign of a culture soon to become obsolete, the last vestiges of which relegated to those who are doomed to never, so to speak, catch up. To illustrate using one more proximate example, in his insightful book, Radical Hope, Ethics in the Face of Cultural Devastation, Jonathan Lear tells the story of the Crow Nation. In giving an account of what occurred when his tribe was confined to a reservation and the buffalo had been led away, the chief of the nation says, quote, the heart of my people fell to the ground and they could not lift them up again. He concludes by saying somewhat enigmatically, quote, after this, nothing happened. What does such a phrase mean? After this, nothing happened. How could anything not happen? Did history or perhaps life come to an end even as it continued? There is something more to this confession, the disclosure possibly of a form of dispossession that empties the world of meaning. In this reading, progress may be interpreted as a rather cruel desertion, an abandonment of those not able to keep up with its pace or demands, or not fully inhabit its potential, on whose part, after all, and in the name of which power? Should we not be forced then to at least also speak of loss? Or at least take a moment to reflect on what costs have been exacted, on whom and where, and perhaps to recognize that progress has never looked especially promising for those who find themselves in its way. Indeed, the idea that there is no limit to what human beings are capable of may now sound to some more like a threat than a promise. All this is not to say before the charge is even made that these other forms of life, indeed other life worlds, were idyllic, much less an untainted, innocent paradise. It is, however, to say that too much remains obscured from view. That perhaps to sever some forms of attachment is injurious, possibly fatal, 
including those attachments which appear irrational and possibly even self-sabotaging. And that this too must be taken into account in any narrative of progress as pure liberation. And it is also to say more essentially that these peoples and worlds did not have the hubris or perhaps only the means to inflict or bestow their cultures, practices, languages, traditions on the entire planet. And that too in the name of good, of universal emancipation. It is also to point out that the wiser thinkers of the ancient world did not profess faith in progress as a temporally, chronologically determined improvement in the conditions of human life. Think, for instance, of the Roman Stoic philosopher Seneca, who believed in progress as the human capacity for the expansion of knowledge, but did not expect from it any improvement in the general community of humankind. Such humility, if one can even call it that, or helplessness is worthy of reflection. What makes our moment, our world, such that we believe unequivocally that the world must, without resistance or a resistance made futile, submit to it or ideally fall enthusiastically into its embrace with the conviction that such submission will enhance the well-being of all the world. Given its dominance and more importantly its implicit hierarchies, for the billions left out of this triumphant march, those who remain insistently or without a choice on the peripheries or for those who have insufficiently moved along this hapless yet quite clear trajectory, we have little left but derision or even worse, pity. We can only think or to be certain as a matter of historical fact that those who live in this moment, who exist however precariously in this time, do not in fact have a place in it. These people, the benighted majority, uninvited to join this exalted mission, who live in this time, where else indeed would they live, belong elsewhere in a history long lost or relinquished, as though they are suffering from a lack, an absence, as if they no longer correspond to this time, or that time is hurtling towards an end to which they can never hope to arrive. It is to treat living people as if they were their own ghosts, as good as already dead, haunting the modern present, as if already banished from the world, hoping in the manifest destitution of their condition for their own exorcism. The structures of the modern world perhaps like the pre-modern, but we all know how terrible those were, seem routinely to produce such superfluous and marginalized communities. These are not exceptions, as we often think or are told, but rather the consequence of a structure of power that necessitates subordination on the part of majority populations. It matters very little what form they take within developed or developing societies, as effects or products of an increasingly voracious capitalism, a system itself predicated on untold exclusions, or within broader systems of total control. And given the means at our disposal, these people, and countless others, can be dispensed of in unparalleled numbers. In the most spectacular example, World War II, which occurred principally, of course, in the most modern and developed of all societies, World War II resulted in as many as 80 million deaths. 80 million. To say nothing of the manner of those deaths, as original and stunning as unspeakably horrifying, one would like to say inhuman, but sadly they are perhaps and only all too human. 
In more recent memory, the Cold War, so terribly and misleadingly named, is the perfect example of the hierarchy of power and of life that seems so indelibly etched in our collective consciousness. This period of several decades, from 1945 to roughly 1990, widely regarded as a time of peace because the two then most powerful countries managed to resist mutual destruction and seemed instead content to wage their wars elsewhere, where perhaps the absence of peace was incidental or maybe irrelevant. This period was among the most brutal in much of the developing world. Against received wisdom and very much on the contrary, these decades were marked by widespread and devastating war, the so-called proxy wars, and not only those, waged between the two superpowers, resulting in millions of casualties, even more refugees and displaced persons. And before we dismiss this as ancient history, we need to recall the enduring legacy of these wars. Consider, for instance, the landmines that still kill and maim thousands from Laos to Afghanistan, most of them children. So how are we to evaluate this period and its characterization, disgracefully referred to by some historians as the long peace? What allows such an appellation and how, even in the abstract, does this have to do with progress and its valuations? There are other examples. One thinks of those who bear the costs of one of the signature, if collateral, consequences of accelerated progress. We are living now in the Anthropocene. In other words, our present geological age is the first in which human activity has been the dominant influence on the climate and environment. This has had the effects it has, with which we are now all too familiar, despite the insistence of some in this country that it is a fiction, or to quote one presidential contender, climate change is a hoax invented by the Chinese to undermine the US economy. Such a dismissal is only possible in a context that is spared the most brutal effects of this scientific fact. It is the world outside, structurally and repeatedly consigned to irrelevance, which suffers its worst consequences, as in India, to name only one of literally innumerable examples, where over 300,000 farmers have killed themselves in the last 20 years. 300,000 farmers have killed themselves in the last 20 years. The causes, as with everything, are complex, but have minimally to do with repeated droughts, or conversely, excessive rainfall, both leading to successive years of crop failure, with farmers having no option but to resort to bank and private loans, resulting eventually, if predictably, in crippling debt. And for all the talk of India as a rising power, of having progressed at a marvelous rate, agriculture remains the single largest employment sector, with 70% of India's 1.2 billion people living in rural areas, areas that have long been made uninhabitable for reasons apart from climate change, of course, but with climate change too, as an effect of the rampant modernization spawned and implemented over decades of development policy. Then, more visibly, there's the story now haunting the world of Syria, of Iraq, though the latter, given our chronic historical amnesia, has faded virtually entirely from memory, despite its almost complete ruin. In Syria, then, Aleppo, one of the world's oldest continually inhabited cities, the mention of which left one third-party candidate utterly mystified. In Aleppo, then, suffering from the misfortune of its geographic location, 
modern warfare has done what successive invasions failed to do throughout the ages, laying waste to half the city. This ancient World Heritage Site, as it was designated by UNESCO, is now threatened with total annihilation. We have come so far that one is tempted to say that this inexorable advance of progress has no end in all senses. It will both continue and also have no definable goal. We see now some of its less benign effects. The proliferation of means making possible the destruction of the world and that too many more times than once. Structural enduring inequalities in wealth, opportunity, inclusion. The total conquest of nature. The almost complete devastation of social relations, communities, and bonds. A denuded morality, a concept which appears now an anachronism, insistently lingering somewhere in the shadows associated only with the worst conservatism as a relic from another time once defined by a sense of restraint, a time that must urgently be left behind. The collapse of any substantive politics or the possibility of participation in the political process, no matter how democratic, a term itself that has long been evacuated of meaning and yet remains one of the signature marks of progress. The hierarchies of life, human life above the world of nature, of course, but also of certain human lives, certain forms of living above others. So in light of this, not to mention colonialism, total war, genocide, totalitarianism, etc. Is it possible to be consoled by the thought that progress will one day, in the indefinable future, close yet so far, free us all entirely from what apparently constrains our full human potential? Should we not instead conclude that the brutal violence inflicted by human beings under any name, torture, slavery, genocide, cannot be consigned to the past like exhausted theories in science. They simply return in a different guise. And given the means now available to us, it may be easier to imagine the end of the world than any significant improvement in it. There is also not the ancillary fact that the idea of humanity itself seems a fiction composed as it is of billions of people, for each of whom life is singular, unique, and naturally final. So what would it mean to speak of a general progression, of a general progress, encompassing every single one of the seven billion human lives now present on Earth? As appears increasingly true, Human beings have been blessed or cursed, depending on the moment, with a seemingly limitless capacity for enhancing knowledge while being chronically incapable of learning from it or from experience. One such edifying realization might be that there can be little progress, only an unending struggle with our own obstinate nature. Parenthetically, psychoanalysis, which is both an intellectual project and clinical method, has largely fallen into disrepute, no doubt in part because of its avowed admission of the limits of human agency. Nevertheless, psychoanalysis wisely, though in what now appears to be a wholly futile gesture, tried to inform us that human beings can scarcely be masters of their destiny we might instead come to view the idea of resignation as a virtue, though resignation has long been considered a form of weakness and even worse, submission, as if through sheer will, itself hardly a constant or even definable force, we might alter the conditions of our own existence or even more brazenly imagine that we can change those of humanity at large. 
Freud suggested that we come instead to understand the determining role of fate and history in our lives while also affirming a more modest ambition, namely effecting a minor change in our orientation toward that fate as also toward our place in the social world. Finally, a few words on the link between progress and peace, if indeed there is one or maybe one. Quite apart from this only very partial chronicle of warfare and dispossession, peace is invoked by everyone, not least those governing affairs of state, national and global, who repeatedly, tirelessly profess an absolute commitment to peace while inflicting the worst atrocities in its name. There are, of course, countless others with less cynical, more benevolent intentions, but given the ubiquity of the word in the mouths of everyone, should we not be at least a little suspicious at every moment of its enunciation? Should we think instead, in light of what has occurred and more of the same likely to come, that even if we assume human progress is an evolutionary process, a movement of space within time, of time within space, of which peace may be a part, that progress is a process that may well be going nowhere. And still, as John Gray reminds us in his remarkable book, The Silence of Animals, to suppose that the myth of progress could be shaken off would be to ascribe to modern humanity a capacity for improvement even greater than what it ascribes to itself. I'd like to end with one of the canonical readings of progress, which seems only to become more prescient with the passage of time, though it was written at the very pinnacle of human debasement, the mid-20th century. The German-Jewish essayist and philosopher Walter Benjamin writes then of the angel of history, whose face, quote, is turned toward the past. Where we perceive a chain of events, he sees one single catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay awaken the dead, make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. This storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. Thank you. There. Um, so, I mean, all, it beautifully and passionately and poetically said, and, and I really appreciate what you said, it, it's sort of um, it's, it seems that the, um, the real progress, I mean, you can, you can say that pro you can define progress as scientific progress and all of that that's led us down that road without any wisdom. But another kind of progress is that internal progress, which is perhaps the only kind of progress that, that, is, that is real or, or whatever. But I mean, it, that, that is the kind of progress that our entire education system seems to be turning its back on in favor of, of mathematics and, and applied science that can be applied to making more things to, uh, to sell. Yes, uh, I agree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, the, the, th that's exactly right. And, and what I was trying uh, to say um, is that the system we live in, 
where we've arrived, how we've gotten here, I don't know. But where we are has had, has produced costs, has exacted costs, many of which we ourselves are not even aware of. Which is why I, you know, the, the example of the, the Crow Nation, it's, I don't know how you convey um, psychic violence. I don't know how you convey what it means for a people to lose their language or to feel that the language that was theirs or their parents or their grandparents or for generations is now worth nothing. Nothing in the sense that if you speak this language, you will be destitute, poor, and dead. Right? How does one give an account of what that means for billions of people? Right? And yet that is the structure we live in. And this is, forget all of the more, the most obvious forms of violence and you know, poverty, inequality, all of those things are there. But at the same time there is, and so the point that you made about elevating science and math and all of this, it's all in the service of what? It's in the service of perpetuating a system that rests, that is structured on the dispossession of the majority of the world's population. That is not incidental. Right? It's absolutely built into the foundation of the system of which we are all a part. So, you know, I think in a lot of the, the, the conversations, and it's very important, obviously, to think of specific uh, uh, moments, specific instances in which people can intervene and have, as it were, their voices heard. That's, I, I'm completely, that, that, yes, that makes a lot of sense. But I think it's also very important um, to try to keep in mind a more, um, I don't even know more, no, a historical, that there was time before this time, right? There were, people lived and still try, although they're not succeeding and they won't for long even if they are now, to live in a radically different way. People lived with values that we, we have no conception of, we can't even imagine. And all we can think is, oh, well, they didn't have the, po if they all could have had air conditioners and 20 iPods and iPads or whatever, then they would have. Well, I, I don't, I mean, what is that argument? Maybe, but maybe not, right? Why would we, why would we assume that our own desire and the structure of our desire now can be projected all the way back and f we can feel sorry for the, too bad they didn't have iPads, right? I mean, I'm making, it's a caricature, but you see that we, we have this assumption, which in many cases, as I've said, you know, I, I'm not entirely disputing, that we live somehow at, uh, at the highest possibility or we're getting there, okay? We're on the track, so there are minor problems, and, but we're gonna adjust those, right? It's a self-correcting system. So capitalism will now somehow reform itself to be more answerable to the people. I mean, or um, climate, cli the climate, it's, well, we're gonna resolve this, right? It's just a matter of a few, we'll do this here and do that there, and the Paris Climate Ag Agreement was signed, and then what? It, it's to see that, and I don't wanna sound so fatalistic, although I will, um, that there's a system that's been put in place, and again, I don't know how it got there and who's responsible for its continuation, but it's almost as though it now has its, it has its own propulsion and its own logic, and it will continue until it doesn't because this earth, we've eaten it alive, and it's not gonna keep sustaining the people who are on it for all eternity, irrespective of what we think we can recycle our newspapers and our bottles. It's not gonna get us very far huh, after thousands of years or hundreds of years of eating the earth. Thank you. I recently read a book by uh, Viktor Frankl. He, he survived the, the horrible mm -hmm. death camps. And as long as I've talked about peace, I almost have to say I wonder if we ever can achieve it because it looks like, according to him, that we have evolved to be this way. We have evolved to want to protect our environment. It's just like the birds. I mean, we hear the beautiful sound of the birds. We think, isn't that nice? But really what they're saying is, look out, this is my territory, and don't you dare encroach on it. And so I don't know how we can ever get beyond that evolutionary phase of our, our lives today.
So I can just comment? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. Uh, do you remember what the name's Man's Search for Meaning or something, the Viktor Frankl book? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I liked that very much uh, when I read it. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's you, you got exactly the, the problem. The problem is that within the word itself, progress, there are very good connotations, right? Because we think of it um, as, it, the connotation is of course one of improvement, right? Um, and this is not to impute uh, intentions to whoever, I mean, I can speak of it in the context of development in, in the third world, right? The idea of development which came um, in the, uh, as the, the, the Second World War ended, a number of colonies, uh, former colonies, became uh, decolonized, uh, former French and, and British uh, colonies, others as well. And the idea was, it was a very benevolent idea, right, um, much like colonialism had been, uh, is that these people, because they're poorer, the darker races, as it were, um, they, don't, they haven't had the gift of enlightenment, they need roads and schools and, you know, so it's, it's, um, it's impulse, let's say, let's, and with, this is bracketing for the moment, cynicism, right? Saying, well, actually what they wanted was markets or what they wanted was cheap labor or what they want. Let's even bracket that, right? Let's just say that what they actually wanted was these people to become like us. One has to think of what kind of narcissistic delusion <laughs> makes that possible when World War II has just ended. Right? And we can all think, well, that was an exception. Right? That was exceptional in the history of Europe, Euro-American humanity. That is an exception. Whereas whatever barbarism we see in Africa, Asia, or Latin America, that's the norm. Right? Their violence is normal, and our violence is exceptional. Right? We erred. But we didn't mean to. Right? It's too bad for those 80 million people, but okay, whatever. We'll be better next time. <laughs> Right? But it's absolutely implicit, right? Because we are the ones who will show these other people, we will teach them, we will give them our textbooks, we'll build their railroads, and we'll make hospitals for them, right? In a gesture of benevolence. And I'm not doubting again that in part it was that, but in part it was many other things too, and it had many other effects. And those effects are what we need to understand. And this Viktor Frankl, the, the, the book that you cited, it's precisely that, right? That there was that the logic, the Holocaust, and everything that occurred and could only have been possible with this degree of progress. It was not possible. You could kill people, and you wanted to kill as many people as you wanted to kill, but you couldn't, you couldn't put them in gas chambers and organize them, right? You couldn't count them, organize them, build structures that would burn them to ashes. This is a unique modern invention that happened in the heart of Europe. Europe, which had at its peak colonized 80% of the world, right? That form of administering populations and doing away with them is a modern phenomenon. Yes, wars were waged in the past, and yes, all kinds of brutalities I am not in the least bit defending. But the scale we have to consider, the scale, the scale, I mean, on what basis do we have nuclear weapons that can destroy the world a thousand times over. I mean, what? It's not enough once. What? I mean, it might. What? How, I mean, what do you say? It's insanity. Yeah, I mean, it's beyond insanity, and everybody knows it. We all live in this, and then there's all this discussion. What is the U.S. policy? No first use. Will Obama change it? Will Obama not change it? And what is no first? I mean, I don't know if you guys saw the second debate or the first debate. Uh, of course, Trump had no idea what is no first use. Clinton changed the subject, so we have no idea what the candidates think. <laughs> but the U.S. is is. Um, is the only, well, not, I don't know if it's the only country, but it has not committed to this, uh, to the idea that would only use nuclear weapons as a defense. In other words, if it's attacked, then uh, 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 the U.S. says no. The U.S. maintains the right for first use to be the, first, you know, the country to use nuclear weapons first. But it's that, you know, we can talk about these little things like, you know, oh, it should be this way and it should be, but I mean, you just have to think, I mean, just structurally, what, what, how did this, how did it come, how did this happen? Whose idea was it that we should have a quadrillion nuclear weapons? And if we're so concerned about the fate of humanity, right? Well, what about the, the uh, 300,000 farmers who've killed themselves or the children who are starving to death all over the planet? Why not destroy one nuclear weapon, right? I mean, if you really, your heart is bleeding for all of humanity, 
Well, there has to be a better demonstration of it than that. Are you familiar with the book of uh, Fre Freire, Freire mm. and the Paula, Paula, Freire. Like, and the veins of the, you know, and reading that, uh, and, uh, the the torture and the, the the devastation that was done to the people of South America mm. by the Spaniards. Are you talking about the open veins of Latin America, yes. Eduardo Galeano? And, yeah. and that is such a painful mm. book. Talk about progress, you know, and, and putting these people to, to work in mines. These were the elites of the society at the time, and within days, within hours, they were dead from exhaustion and overwork and so forth. Uh, it's such a painful book, you know. That's progress, you know. It's. Terrific. You have to read that. And what happened when the, when the Americas were discovered? Discovered, and you know the natives had these beautiful gardens and sustainable crops, and they knew how to use the land and so forth and so on. We were going to teach them better. That's right. You know, it's very painful if you read the history and you you relate to it mm -hmm. or try to relate to the people and understand what it must have been. There. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And this is really an unanswerable question, but really, how do we go about changing the paradigm of progress? What, what is it that, I mean, clearly, there's something in us that's leading us, or this belief. I, I actually, I'll go on an aside. My, my mother is sort of the person who believes that progress is always positive. And she says, it's because I'm an optimist. <laughs> And I think that any progress, scientific or whatever, is going to move us to a better place. Clearly, that's not happening. So how do we change the paradigm? I mean, how do we adjust our thinking and how we look at progress and how society should be, should be formed? I mean, you know, I, I, I think your mother is right in a certain sense. I mean, that, and that's an opinion that's shared by many people. And to a large extent, it is true, which is why, I mean, there are many things that have happened that have obviously um, dramatically altered uh, the conditions of our material well-being. Not all of us, of course, not even the majority of us, but certainly some of us. Um, I mean, I think one of the reasons why I tend um, to think more structurally uh, is, by which I mean rather than thinking of specific let's say policies or a specific event, you know, like last week this happened or next week this will happen or it'll be the elections and then it'll be clean. Um, that, I mean, and that's not to say, I mean, obviously I work in the news, I do this every day. But I think that it's, it's very important for, for us, um, for people as it were, who have some uncynical, right, to whatever extent, uh, untainted, um, unsullied desire for a moderately better world, uh, or better part of the world at least, um, that it's very important for us to think about what we're doing. And I don't mean in the sense of, you know, should I uh, protest X thing that's happened? I mean, yes, of course, yes. There's no, I'm not saying don't, you know, sit around and, but it's also to, to take a larger view, you know, to read history, to read what is it, how is it that we understand a word that is being used now and what it really means, right? I mean, it's of course the biggest cliche now, everybody says, as I did too, in a cliched way, democracy. Well, what does it mean now? And it's not to say that I don't, I think undemocratic societies are better than this one or a, d a democratic one, but what does democracy itself now consist in really? You know, what are, what are the range of options that are available? What, so all of this to say that in, in every instance, if one can just take a more, also a more abstract view, abstract and historical view to see where we stand. So that's the, with the idea of progress, um, implicit, as your mother said, and explicit too, the idea of an improvement. Well, what is it that we want to improve? For whom? Uh, are things improving, 
and also what is what is the opposite of what's occurring or what's hidden below what we know is occurring because there's always something else going on right there's no story of um, completely seamless gain I mean if you just think of a life story any of you me right I can't tell my life as one of you know I've grown up I was a little kid then I became a bigger kid then I became you know uh, what am I yes in that sense yes I grew up but my life or your lives I imagine any human life is not a uh, a seamless progression which implies necessarily an improvement along an aging continuum. Of course not, right? Things go terribly awry, things go very, very well, things go very, very sad. I don't know, a million things happen. So why would we think of progress in a more global sense as a seamless or relatively seamless um, secular improvement in the conditions of life for everyone? It seems odd, no? You think of your own life, you think of a society, you think of a country, you think of a people. If it's not true of them, why w and, and then think, well, what is it that you want it to be and what is it failing to be? I mean, I don't know that that answers your question at all, but that's just roughly what, what I think. Uh, it, thank you, sorry, so loud. It's difficult not to conclude that education as we know it has been a disaster in its effects, if not its intentions. Could you comment on that? You know, I, I have to say that one of the, this, um, uh, an older uh, uh, person whom I knew, uh, who's since passed away, um, he was two generations uh, above me and he, uh, he said to me once that it was very, he himself was highly educated. Um, he said to me once that he was very surprised by the fact that the more educated people he met, the less, um, he was struck by how much less uh, kind or generous they were, like instinctively, right, by default. Whereas um, in his own, wherever it is that he'd grown up, where people were largely, and this is of course not to glorify or say it's wonderful, everybody should be illiterate, no. It's just to say that this is one particular um, perspective on it, that there was a kind of way of being with other people that was not <coughs> quite so instrumental. It's not to say that education is the cause of it, but because education came with a lot else, with uh, 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 the construction of a society that made people means, right? Means to an end, or education itself now, right? No one thinks, oh, I just want to sit around reading Plato because I need to figure out what to think. No, no, no. It's I'll read Plato, and then in my entrance exam to X, I'll be able to say why. And then if I get into this school, then maybe when I go, you know, and that's not an individual student's fault. It's the system of education in which we're all trapped. I mean, here, but it's also now more or less, I mean, not everywhere, but it's certainly spreading everywhere in the world. So yes, I mean, I think education, of course, it's a very good idea. I think everybody, whatever, if they want to learn how to read and write, they definitely should, and they should certainly have the opportunity. But to think that education, as so many people did, um, you know, uh, and probably still do, that education is somehow the panacea, and that what people lack is knowledge as though people without education lacked knowledge, right? No, they had a very different kind of knowledge. Um, but this kind of knowledge, that what if, if they were only taught, right? They were taught, then they would act differently. I don't think there's that much evidence of that. It's true that, you know, the kinds of brutality we know of from medieval or pre-modern, you know, nailing their hands with like nails and, you know, taking a hammer and taking out people's teeth and so, I mean whatever they were obviously very very brutal and horrible forms of mutilation torture and so on that's true it just seems that the violence um, has taken a, a, a shape that is much less recognizable as violence right and drone warfare is just the natural culmination of that right we want to become as distant as possible from our own murders right as far away it's almost as though then we can dis it wasn't me right uh, who was it i don't know who it was 
right? I mean, I'm not even in, I'm not even in a plane, <laughs> right? Forget being like on the ground with someone, like wrestling or trying to strangle someone with your own hands. You're sitting in, a, in an air uh, thing, control thing in Nebraska and killing someone in Yemen, right? I mean, it's like completely bizarre. And yet it is still that. It is still a murder. So what, in a sense, and this is obviously putting it very crudely, what education has enabled, and this is obviously a caricature, but I'll make it anyway. Um, it has enabled that distance from one's own murder, right? Because education allowed you to come to the point that you made a drone. A drone, a drone can be used for many, many, many purposes. And what did we decide to do? We decided to use it as a means to carry out killings in our countries, in which, incidentally, not out of some benevolence, right? But we just don't want to have the legality and the, the, the compromise of American lives, which of course we must recognize are far more, uh, I mean, they, they are on a different planet, a galaxy compared to the lives of others. We won't compromise those. And you come up with this. I'm sure, of course, there are five billion, trillion other good uses of education, but it's also, if there are those, we must also look at the other side. There are also these. So Nirmi, is your, is your measure of progress that we should stop? <laughs> progress? <laughs> well, I, my measure, if my measure counts for anything, is that it doesn't matter what we think, right? It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Things, I mean, we could think it's wonderful, we could think it's terrible, we could think it should stop, we could think it should continue indefinitely. But um, it, it just seems that, that it has, uh, it's there, and it'll continue to be there long after we no longer are. Uh, and I think it's uh, the only thing, which I really believe is the only thing that one can try to do which is already an impossible task, is to master one's own, oneself. And I don't mean this in some kind of navel-gazing, narcissistic, self-development kind of way, no. It's that to recognize if we see something that's terrible in the world that is being done, you recognize that the people who are perpetrating that terribleness are not that different from you and I. Right? It's not, it's like not us and them and this kind of thing. It's like you're, you know, it's like the, it's a very fine line. You want to make sure that you're on this side of it and not that, at least most of the time. And I don't, you know, I, it's not, because I think that's a very, very big problem uh, that, that we have in, in, in uh, that the way that we understand good or bad, um, that it's very hard for us to see in ourselves, right? Not, not in other people, in ourselves our own less, uh, let's say, august desires, behaviors, uh, intentions. And if one can, if one, well, it's probably too, um, I think we would all do well to pause, to think, and to try to govern our own uh, instincts and then perhaps be in a position to teach anybody else anything. Hi. Oh, that's loud. <laughs> um, hey, um, my name is Jeremy. Um, I uh, live in Portland. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Um, thank you so much for coming out here and speaking with us. It was great. Um, so I have a quick question that I've been trying to sort of struggle to put the words around. So just kind of bear with me here. Um, so, so this is something that I was thinking about throughout your talk. But what do you see as being the role of religion moving forward in the, this discussion of progress um, and you know it's it's something that seculars will say you know religion is backwards um, and you know like language like you mentioned it was used as a tool of oppression and progress in many colonized nations um, to make people more like us quote unquote um, but it's also an institution of community making and it can lead to spiritual and uh, like spiritual enlightenment, um, can create love and can give people like those who are sort of been systematically destroyed 
um, a sense of purpose when their hearts are on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just sort of putting it out there as a question, I guess, what do you see as being the role of religion in progress? Thank you for that. Well, what's your name, sorry? Jeremy. Jeremy. Yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. That's a, yeah, that's, that's a very, um, that's very beautifully put. Um, you know, it's like the, the point about um, torture, slavery, genocide, etc., not being consigned to the past as something that has ended, or if it's ended, it appears in a different guise today. Right, so that it's not to think that something ends and it's over and that same thing doesn't occur now under a different name, right? So I think the same is true of religion. In other words, the kind of fervor, right, that religion is said to have incited in the past, which it did, uh, and violence and so on, and, and of course to this day, um, that you can fill religion in with whatever you want, it doesn't matter insane capitalism, insane atheism, insane... I mean, there are a million different um, I ideologies that can fill that same function if one is going to talk about the perversion or lunacy of a belief. What that belief is, to me, it makes it, it very, very little difference. And I think part of the problem with um, uh, uh, critiques, uh, criticisms of, of religion, uh, are that they fail to see precisely what you said, that for the large majority of humanity, though we don't meet them, religion is an absolutely defining uh, um, experience in their lives, and also, as you said, an extraordinary source of solace when there is so little. So then we want to tell them, actually, that if you want to become modern, you become like us. Right? Or else you're just not making it. You have all these whacked out. Or if you do believe, whatever you believe, you just keep it at home. Don't try to bring it into any community. Or if you do, you should hide. Right? I mean, it's, it's like a very, um, it's like we can now tolerate. Like, t what does tolerance mean now? Tolerance means we'll put up with things we don't really mind. But, you know, the idea of tolerance is actually that you, you tolerate what you find despicable. That idea is completely gone. This is, uh, makes no sense to anybody. If something is, is uh, uh, offensive to me, it just should not be before me. So, I mean, to answer more directly your question, I, I, um, I mean, now, of course, what do we hear? Religion, it's like fucking Al-Qaeda and ISIS and murder and so on. I mean, there, I mean, I don't even know where to begin with that. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know, uh, anything I say will be a cliche. It's not about religion. It's not about, uh, so let's just assume that, let's assume that what goes on in the name of an ideology often has very little to do with the ideology itself, right? Like people say, oh, communism didn't work, it, you know, well, I mean, I guess, in the way that it was practiced, yeah, it didn't work, in a way, I guess. But then you could also say, well, I don't know, demo does democracy, I, I don't know, does it, I don't know, right? So, I mean, it's like, what, what are you trying to say, right? I mean, it's like, if people are, are going to be unreasonable, which it seems it's in our nature to do, or violent, or oppressive, or uh, monstrous, they can do it under any label they c choose. It doesn't really matter. And so, in my view, no. Religion cannot and should not be singled out as the perpetrator of the worst atrocities in the world. There are many, many, many people and ideologies competing for that position. I'm wondering if, if uh, progress and religion are perhaps antithetical and that uh, the idea of religion is, tends to maintain and go towards, back towards a, a root idea, progress going towards some kind of projected advancement, whether or not, at what cost, we don't know. But my question to you is, uh, we have so much information that we are buffeted with that it's very difficult not to become either pessimistic or cynical but if you had to choose between being uh, pessimistic, optimistic, or realist, or what have you, 
what stance would you advise as being the best to uh, tackle what we have ahead of us? You know, I, I was talking to my friend here, uh, Dushan, who's a very dear and old friend of mine who teaches uh, in Portland. Um, and I was thinking, because of course, as you can imagine, when I, when I speak um, in places, it's, it, people often ask, you know, is there any hope and so on. Um, <laughs> so I thought today I would actually think about this. Um, and uh, this, I think this is, this is the right view. Oh, well, I don't know, right. It's the right view for me in the moment, and it may well be for you as well. Um, Antonio Gramsci uh, wrote in his prison diaries, about the pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the will, right? So you recognize that, or the, another example that, that Dushan gave me um, is of a pessimist activist. Pessimistic activism, right? So you do a, a billion things, you get whatever, I obviously go to work, Democracy Now!, you know, following a million different things that are going on, as all of you are doing very, very, um, uh, you know, committed and worthwhile work, that you do everything you do, whatever it is you can do that you think will make something somewhere a little better, but you do it knowing that it probably won't. It's not very... Um, you know, and then another, this is another thing that I came up with, Dushan. One other, sorry, quote. This is the um, early 20th century a German playwright, Bertolt Brecht. And he says, in these dark times, will there also be singing? Yes, there will be singing about these dark times. So... There are many ways of interpreting that. Dushan and I were talking about it before coming here. Um, one is that when things are as they are, whatever can be said can only be about those things being as bad as they are. The second is, which was Dushan's, which I think is right, is that art, like song, can both, because he says, yes, there will be, it's not like song is not allowed. You will sing, art will continue, right? Voice, art, however it is, poetry, it will continue, but it will also be a reflection of the time in which it's produced. To me, that's very, uh, obviously, it's, it's rather modest, um, but that's quite hopeful, in fact. Uh, thanks so much for your talk. I really got a lot out of it and I, um, the way of thinking that you're laying out is fascinating. I'm trying to take it all in. Oh, thank um, you. But I guess one question I have is, aren't you talking, or to what extent are you talking about Western ideas of progress and are we limited to that? I, it sounds like maybe we are, but um, aren't there other ideas of the future that come from other cultures that we could turn to or try to include, like for instance, the Wabanaki people in Maine have a notion of the new dawn, which is coming. And I like that idea. <laughs> so anyway, I'm just, I'm just wondering, you know, am, am I wrong to say that this is Western, a Western idea of progress, or do you feel like it's global at this point, and et cetera? Well, I mean, yes, it is. It is uh, I mean, its origins are in uh, what is, yeah, the West. Um, the problem I have is, which I find very, very disturbing is, which has happened really uh, with such uh, alacrity in my own lifetime, is the extent to which the world has become like one, but in the worst possible way. Everywhere you go, all over the planet, there is hyperconsumption, the most inane media, 12 billion cars, worsening pollution, uh, rampant, insane consumerism. Um, I, I don't know, everybody talking about the same kinds of things. Uh, it's very, very, so perhaps all, and no doubt, all these cultures and peoples and places at one moment had a different conception of what constituted a good life and a good future, a conception of the future. I'm sure those people exist. 
we'll never hear from them. I mean, you happen to live in Maine and you happen to know, and you know, whatever, I'm sure if I go somewhere and meet people who are, I could, yeah. It's not about to become as, uh, it's, it, I mean, this, this ideology, um, it's all pervasive, it's everywhere. And it's also, it's extremely seductive, right? It's ev it's, so everybody is into the whole thing. And um, I, I don't know how uh, that, that would change. Earlier, one of the elders of Peace Action Maine, Sally Breen, uh, mentioned the name of Viktor Frankl, and he was an uh, uh, Austrian or German Jew who was in a concentration camp, and, and he, he devised a method of therapy that he called um, logotherapy. In other words, he felt that there, there is an underlying meaning to life, and that uh, that is, and what he said was, he could, he, he, he spent four years in concentration camps, and uh, uh, he, among, the, among the inmates, what he noticed was that those who had a, some sense of transcendent meaning, it might be something as simple as the hope that their, uh, that their, their spouse may have survived, or their child may have survived, even though they were in the camp, those were the people who tended to survive longer, whereas those who gave up hope died quickly, gave up a sense that, that there was any meaning to this. And I think what, what, uh, what I gather from your talk largely is that the, uh, th th this concept of progress that we have evolved in our society, our civilization, very Western, uh, it, it, what it, what it teaches beneath the surface of education and media and everything else is, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, you can, you mentioned rampant conservat uh, consumerism and so on, and you know there's a litany of the the um, the evidences of this definition of progress, but yet they're the seeds. Jeremy in the back raised the the point about religion and. I, th I, I, gathered I gathered Jeremy wasn't talking so much about institutional religions, but he was talking about a, um, an inner sensibility that is more like what Viktor Frankl, who was not religious, <laughs> he, his, his form of therapy was called existential therapy. He was an existentialist. And so, you know, he, and he witnessed and experienced some of the worst horrors that, that any of us in the last century or so have experienced. And yet, he survived and he lived well into his 80s, late 80s, I think, and, uh, and he was liberated from the camps and so on. But he, um, he felt that there was, a, that there was a, uh, an intrinsic sense of meaning mm -hmm. to life and that some people discover it, mm -hmm. e e even a glimpse of it in the camps and it, and it enabled them to survive. So. That would be a, 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 I mean, I appreciate something like the Wabanatsuki uh, idea of a new dawn coming and so on, but, but that, things of that nature may be just evidences of this intrinsic sense of mm. meaning in the human psyche, the, in the human soul that's there, but all this so-called progress has, has masked it. Mm. Uh, it's, a very, it's been a very successful masking process for the last century or so. No, of course, that, uh, yeah, I agree with you. And I think that, um, I mean, obviously you guys, you're very lucky to live in, in Maine, uh, in Portland. I live in New York City, um, where, as you might imagine, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, everything is at a very frenetic pace. Um, so what I've, in fact, been saying, um, this thing of you know reflection and a historical perspective and a sense of one's own really quite modest place in the world and so on. These are, these are all in, in some way connected to, to what you're saying that in order to, to I don't know whether it's for hope or um, just to say transcendence, right? One has to look, I'm not sure where, but all the places we're looking are wrong. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not going to come with your new acquisition from the Apple store, you know what I'm saying? Or, I mean, that's, and that's just such an easy thing. But it, it's about something that 
is being eroded, right? And for some people, it has been eroded totally. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right, of course, to live without that is basically not to live, right? The heart of my people fell to the ground and they could not lift them up again. That is this, what, you, what you're saying. The absence of that, what, what Viktor Frankl had, yeah. Well, I do see it is nine o'clock. Um, thank you so much, Narada. Not at all. Thank really you. Nice. Thank you all very much. Thank you.